dear listeners. This is the Infinite Library Podcast once again coming at you with an episode in our Michael Shabon read-through series. Today, we're covering Shabon's second novel, Wonder Boys, published in 1995. The novel centers around the hapless and losing his touch author and fiction teacher, Grady Tripp, who's seeing his life spiral out of his control one weekend wherein his wife leaves him, one of his students attempts suicide, his editor and partner in crime is in town, and he's foolishly attempting to finish his 2,500-page epic novel, also titled The Wonder Boys. This is one of those well-plotted literary fiction novels where the main character is having the worst best time of their lives, and all the setups pay off. There's some great similes and images every few pages in Shaban's wonderful style, and having spent some time in the orbit of an MFA program, this book captures the feeling perfectly, with various people commenting on each other's prose styles, personal successes, and gossipy, dramatic social lives. Uh, John and I go a bit long on this one. Our conversation touches on the phenomenon of the second novel, Shaban using Wonder Boys to reflect on his future, and uh, what the novel calls the quixotic nature of male friendship. But we hope you excuse the somewhat rustic and in-the-room feel of this recording, and we hope you enjoy the conversation. John, it's so good to be looking you. Here we are live in the studio, the Infinite Library studio. Well, I mean, we always record in person in spirit uh, when we're bodily transported to the Infinite Library, the physical cosmic location uh, that, again, someday will be flushed out in nostalgia critic style lore. <laughs> Yeah, we'll have long explainer videos to tell <laughs> all of the various rooms of the infinite library. Yeah. Uh, and we'll fight like a, a demon who wants to make everyone read Percy Jackson or something. Yeah, n- n- yeah, the, uh, the demon will force everyone to only read YA books. <laughs> <laughs> um, but today is not that day. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, Ben, you were in St. Louis. Uh, bef- we, we were bodily transported uh, from the vantage of sitting at my uh, dining room table instead of uh, uh, from polar opposite ends of the country in St. Louis and, and Bloomington, Indiana. Yeah, I was in town and I figured what better for a uh, one crazy weekend recording session for this coverage of Wonder Boys by Michael Shabon than for us to do it live in the studio. <laughs> Fuck it, we're doing it live Yeah, at the table. Yeah, so... Uh, we're getting uh, we're getting a little different energy than usual, but hey, this is a book that starts with two old friends coming together, uh, two friends who have, have made the questionable decision to go into business <laughs> with one another, <laughs> <laughs> and they're both relying on each other's uh, strange personalities. <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, listeners. Um, when when the infinite library inevitably falls apart ten years from now, <laughs> uh, you can look back to this episode as uh, as a keystone to why maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, much like in uh, Wonder Boys, uh, yeah, we're writing our names on water here in terms I'll, of our. I'll have found a, a a twinky new co-host, <laughs> <laughs> an up and coming twink podcaster, and I'll be embroiled in my numerous relationship fiascos. <laughs> that I, I will no longer. Be be producing my epic podcast about the man without qualities that ends after episode 600. <laughs> okay, slight digression. Yeah, digression, yeah. Uh, uh, I had an audible credit to use this week. There's a man without qualities audiobook. Really? Yes. <laughs> is it complete? Like, is it- let me let me check, actually. Because, I mean, we've talked about Man Without Qualities on this podcast before, but one of the, like, I remember reading a specific academic argument that said in being incomplete, the Man Without Qualities is actually the most complete it could possibly be, which is a fantastic academic circular argument 
to just be like, since he couldn't do it, he completed his uncompletable intentions. <laughs> so it is uh, 60 hours and 30 minutes long. Wow. That's manageable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is the long. Uh, the, no, I've, I've, I have seen one longer audiobook, and it was the complete series of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Wow. Which okay. I think clocks in at like 120 something hours. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Uh, Gibbon was a real freak. <laughs> <laughs> also, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire might be one of the best books to signal that you're a learned person <laughs> just by talking about that. Like, it's one of the, like, I'm a smart guy and this is my smarty pants book. <laughs> uh, wow. All right. Well, uh, that's enough uh, 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 <laughs> broadcasting how erudite we are to the listeners. <laughs> Yeah, so we're here to talk uh, Wonder Boys, Michael Chabon, and as we've alluded to, much of the plot of Wonder Boys is a uh, aging 40-year-old novelist is being visited by his editor, his, uh, as was referred to as, like, quixotic partner in crime from his youth, who is there to check in on the progress of his unfinished masterpiece wonder boys is clocking in something at 2000 pages uh 2500 i think oh 20 fuck even more so yeah. 2500 pages he's been working on it for as it said almost two presidential terms uh, so almost eight years and he's checking in on him uh he hasn't finished it yet and meanwhile there is uh several players in the orbit of this aging novelist one of which is the up-and-coming author uh james but there's also uh an author uh, student who lives in his house, um, also one of his students whose name is escaping me. Um, and then um, basically we see this like crazy weekend play out in this book around uh, the event Word Fest. <laughs> Word Fest, <laughs> yes, which is one of those old fashioned networking events that colleges used to throw uh, where you could meet editors and sign in the like the very weekend you meet them. You could sign a book deal. So, uh, Ben, I, I think that the first thing I kind of want to talk about here is so th this project we've kind of embarked on here, the 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 read through Chabon, um, at least for me, this is the first time I feel like I've consciously decided, like, I'm going to read through an artist's like or a, an author's uh, uh, bibliography, like in chronological order and like yes, kind of try yeah. to see how they grow and develop as a writer, like as they go. Uh, have you ever done anything like that before? Yeah, well, now that I think about it, I've always done it sort of non-chronologically if I'm going to do yeah, it. Yeah, like yeah. I've definitely like gone through authors like oeuvres before. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's always like I'll start with like the one everyone agrees is the best. Yeah. And then it's like I'll pick here and there through their catalog, you know, from there. This yeah. feels kind of starting deliberately from the first book and like working our way through to the last book. Uh, at least for me, this is a new experience. Same, I would um, say, yeah. And I've what I've been struck by uh, uh, to kind of start here with Wonder Boys is so Mysteries of Pittsburgh, which we talked about a couple weeks ago, uh, in a lot of ways felt like the best version of like the MFA first novel. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, it is a book, like it's coming of age novel. It's written by like a young man, like looking towards the future. Um, it's like drawing on different kind of genre elements like he appreciates and like using them in creative new ways. It's using like language in this way that feels very like fresh and exciting while also being very inviting. Um, and Wonder Boys feels like the same thing, but the sophomore novel. Right. Yeah. And. I'll be frank. I like this novel less. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so like, it's not quite a, uh, it's not quite the same looking at it from a sort of age perspective. So like, okay, let me, let me, let me kind of uh, explain myself a little bit. So I think that the sophomore, I mean, the sophomore, any artistic project is usually kind of not necessarily the weird one, but kind of the one, like the whole idea I, I feel like in, in culture is, is, that's kind of where you're working things out. Yeah. You're trying to f really refine like what you're trying to do as an artist. Like the the first work is this kind of spontaneous like eruption of talent. Yeah. You're uh, not even thinking it through consciously at times. It's just happening. You're just yeah. ha you're just trying to do it. Yeah. You're just trying to like get words on a page or paint on a canvas or, you know, notes on a staff and 
the the final outcome is is something you're looking towards, but you don't you don't you have no idea if this is going to be successful. You're just trying to do it. Yeah. And that kind of desperate energy, I think, kind of can give you a lot of momentum that can create something really, really special. Um, even if you then go on to create better work down the line. Right. The sophomore work, and I think Wonder Boys is, yeah, like a, a good example of this. Like, you've done it. You've done the thing. You've written a novel. It was successful. It got bought. You've made, like, presumably for Chabon writing in, like, the late 80s, early 90s. You've made, like, a respectable amount of money. Well, remember, he had a huge advance on Pittsburgh. It was, like, yeah. tons of money. Way more than you usually get. But yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. especially, like, back then. Yeah. Um, well, or way more than you would get now, even for, like, a very promising debut yeah um whereas this novel feels like someone still looking towards the future but like looking at the future with a very different eye like with an eye of a very different kind of uncertainty in terms of so wonder boys felt uh mysteries of pittsburgh felt like a novel written by someone who had no idea what their life was going to be like yeah and didn't know if this writing thing was even going to work out Wonder Boys feels like a novel written by someone who writing has worked out for them in this way that and we'll get to this like kind of doesn't happen anymore like that he is he's secured the bag <laughs> yeah the bag is secure he's got uh, a job lined up like his life path is constraining is, cons yeah. is like narrowing rapidly and even though he's theoretically succeeded at this thing he wants he's like looking into like in this case we we did the math before we did the show um, Chabon wrote this when he was like 34, 35. Yeah. So he's kind of looking at himself as like a, an early to mid 30s guy looking at an early to mid 40s guy and being like, is this where my life's going? And is this like what I'm going to be happy doing? Um, and I think that I'm, I'm not sure because I, I it's been such a long time since I've read his next book, Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, which is the book that really kind of makes his long-term career or yeah that's the the book that like people today will tell you like that or yiddish policeman's union are like his classic those are the ones you read first yeah, those like are the ones i read right. first yeah um but like that's the book those are like his his opuses um whereas wonder boys feels like a, a person who is wondering if he has an opus in him and still kind of leaning on things that served him as a a budding author but I think he has grown out of. Yeah. And along those lines, we mentioned it, but it should be noted that in between writing Pittsburgh and uh, Wonder Boys, he tried to write an opus, the a thousand page, quote unquote, shipwrecked novel Fountain City, which is about the construction of a perfect ballpark. And as he had said multiple times, he would be writing this much like Trip does in Wonder Boys and think about all the things he could be doing instead. And still he's doing this. And he basically was working on it, working on it for years and years. And then one day he just decided to abandon it. He didn't tell his agent and he wrote like a complete draft of Wonder Boys in like, I think, six or seven months. And then he told his agent, hey, I know I said I was working on Infinite Jest 2 or whatever, because it would have been like, I guess Dave Foster Wallace hadn't written Infinite Jest at that point, but like something similar. Uh, but instead, I have Wonder Boys. And so, like, to me, it's like, as you were saying, it's almost a nice dodge as to what's expected of him, where it's like, oh, do I write the big novel? Actually, I'm just kind of going to use what I know and I'm going to invert the telescope. So, like, Mysteries of Pittsburgh is happening to a character in this book who's not the focus. They've already had their Mysteries of Pittsburgh. They're 40 years old. Like, they've made a lot of things that they regret and they sort of follow their impulses how do you tell a story about that? That's how kind of Shabon gets out of this, like sort of hole that he's dug himself, like with fountain city. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I think that like, again, I don't, I don't think this is a bad book uh, by any means. I just think that, um, knowing what came before and what comes after this, uh, this novel felt a little ephemeral yeah. to me. Uh, yeah. And, and I, so this is my second time reading it. Like you said, you had started with, Kevlar Clay and Yiddish. I started with this and then Mysteries of Pittsburgh. Interesting. Yeah. And so I have a fondness for this in terms of I feel like for a conventional book about authors, mm -hmm. I find it to be much more enjoyable than any one of the other ones of those that I've read, just because the, the main character is actually kind of a fuck up. A lot of zany madcap things happen. And I just feel like 
it feels safe, but I think he does a good job doing it that I'm fine with it. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Like it's again, it's one of those things where it's like uh, I still stand by. Like, we have not we've never done a bad book for the show. Yeah. Um, but I think that this novel feels safe in a way that I I mean, Chabon is is definitely like an author who he's a crowd pleaser. Like, yeah, that's kind of yeah. why we're talking about him, because we want to look at somebody who is like. Yeah, kind of bridge that commercial literary gap in a way that a lot of people struggle to do. Um, and that does kind of sometimes lead to like safer writing uh, in a way like, you know, this is not an experimental novel by any way, but it feels like a little too safe. Like, I don't know. I, I read uh, this kind of in conjunction with finishing up a Confederacy of Dunces. Oh, excellent. It's great. Book. Um, yeah. And I felt a little similarly about both of them in that they uh, both feel like novels written by someone who is is confident in their abilities, but um, doesn't hasn't quite worked out what they want to say about anything. Well, do you know about what happened to him? About the, the yeah, uh, the the writer of Confederacy yeah. Dunces. Yes, I, I, I do know his his story, um, but I got to the end of that book and, and the end of this book. And I was like, this felt like someone kind of writing like a TV script. <laughs> well, but the crazy thing about Confederacy of Dunces is just as a sidebar is that like. He was working on it in his room. He lived with his mother, much like in the actual book. His mother is constantly like banging on the door, <laughs> asking him to see what he's working on. And he's like, "Gut away, mom. I'm working on my masterpiece. He writes Confederacy of Dunces. He kills himself. And then his mom finds the book and is like, you should publish this. This is actually really funny. <laughs> and the guy, the editor goes, you know what it is? And he just decides <laughs> to publish it. So like, I think that's an interesting contrast with Shabon, who like, could have he could have just flamed out like yeah. Fountain City could have never gotten written he could have as the some of the stories attest to this he could have been one of those guys that doesn't yeah he could have gotten a job yeah. like working for an ad agency yeah. and just not written anymore so like and he kind of like is able to succeed and I think that's certainly why like this is sort of like a crowd pleasing plot where like the main character despite being kind of a, like a horrible person gets a happy ending because yeah. like why not you know well, like, like I said you know, I, I, yeah. I think it's a good book I just think that. Knowing where we're going. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This just yeah. feels like again, it feels like a sophomore novel. It feels like someone working out like what they actually want to do as an artist in a way that uh, like just because of like the way market forces work, like you have to do this. You have to have your work on display to the world yeah. before you get to like the thing you're really known for. You know, I, I think it's something that we both try to think about as, as kind of, I guess, uh, uh, literary critics of, we'll say a Marxian bent, you know, the, <laughs> the, 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 the context, you know, the economic context in which work is made. And it's yeah, like, it's interesting yeah. to me that again, it's like, we don't have, uh, you know, the stuff Shakespeare did when he was like, 15 right you know we don't uh, the training you yeah, know. It, yeah. Or, you know or just the experimentation you know there are a lot of like canonical works that uh we think of as kind of these eruptions of just uh uh like atemporal like transcendent talent genius but it's like yeah, we just yeah. don't didn't see everything came before because people just didn't have to like publish the way that they did in the 90s or today to stay afloat yeah um and i actually kind of think we're getting a little bit back to that, but in a different direction Yeah, where basically so few people can get published in a way that matters that uh, by the time you get your uh, uh, first novel published, like I uh, we were talking a little bit about a, a book that I'm, I'm not like crazy about, but uh, Manhunt by Gretchen Felker Martin, which is her first novel yeah she'd written and like kind of i guess you would say like self-published like five novels before that that are technically like they're still available yeah. um but they aren't like official this is the break they weren't yeah. like published yeah and so you can at least in her case you can see how she do all this but like there is i think this element today now where uh people can write for years and years and years and yeah they're they're like i've written a novel I didn't get published and it was bad, yeah, yeah. Um, but I did it. Yeah. Uh, and my second novel will presumably look different than maybe what Chabon's first novel looked like, because I'll have actually written a novel before that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's interesting. And like, you know, Chabon's got 
sold to an agent like without the teacher telling him yeah which i think you kind of see shadows of that play in wonder boys where like you know minor you know jumping to the plot one of the one of his students gets his author or gets their first novel sold to a publisher but the teacher isn't involved uh the, it's his, his agent friend crabtree who is like his old partner in crime it was we were saying john uh, a representative of the gay lifestyle <laughs> whereas uh you know for, uh, grady trip is slowly kind of accepting that he's you know he's gonna have a family he might have a kid as we talk about plot wise like that's the kind of path he's choosing not like i can sleep who, with whoever i want and have drugs you know take as many drugs and drink as i want yeah so no, and it's it's interesting, you know, and I think we'll get get to it as we we talk a little bit more deeply about the characters and the plot. But, um, you know, something that I, I'm interested to see as we keep going. Mysteries of Pittsburgh and this novel, Wonder Boys, both feel very like autobiographical in a way like yeah. Wonder Boys a little less so, but it's almost kind of like speculative autobiography. Like, I feel like this is very much Chabon like putting himself like in the shoes, like where he thinks he might be in 10 years and like changing Grady's like superficial characteristics, like just enough that it's like, it's not literally him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, um, I'm curious to see, cause I, I feel like amazing adventures of Cavalier and clay and you just policeman team. Those don't feel like autobiographical books to me. Uh, yeah. They feel like books that deal with like aspects of like Che Bond's, identity as like an artist or like as a Jewish person, but they don't feel like straightforwardly autobiographical to me in the way that like these two books do. And I'm wondering if now having read these two, if those books are going to read very differently to me. Probably, I would say. I also feel like you hear that where like people get comfortable enough with writing that they can like do it about something that's not directly they can about slip them. out of their themselves yeah. to some degree. And that's an interesting theme with in Wonder Boys, too, because uh, one of the persistence themes is the quote unquote secret sharer, uh, which is the theory that some characters, ex ex you know, put forth that some characters deny is that every author has a split personality and that split personality is the person that watches everything that the main person does <laughs> and writes it down <laughs> because they're constantly mining their experience for uh, material and so this leads the main person who's not the secret sharer to live his life dangerously um frivolously uh, uh you know big risks big drama so that they always have something to write about yeah that they're never without material well that is one thing that actually i do want to say i actually do like in this novel is the way that it talks about writing yeah because it's something that I found very uh, like as someone who who is a, a writer, like fitfully, um, you know, it, it there I felt some truth there. Like I, I definitely remember like being younger, particularly and having that same kind of apprehension of like, oh, to be a writer, like I constantly have to be like looking at things going on around me and like taking notes and yeah. being like, oh, I can use that person for this. I can use that person. I can use this experience in my life for that. Um, and also like this idea of like the midnight illness is, yeah, oh, is a way that the Grady uh, yeah. like refers to writing yeah. as, as this, yeah, kind of compulsion, that, like keeps people up into the night. And like, you know, I, I had a night uh, this literally this week where like I could not get to sleep because I just like had so many different ideas going through my head yeah. in terms of like I could write a story about that. I could pull that into that. I could pull this thing that I read in this thing into that. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I'm probably a worse writer because I don't just get up and do it when that happens to me. I just <laughs> grit my teeth and like try to will myself to go to sleep because I have a, I have a day job. Be gone stories. <laughs> <laughs> um, get but, thee to a nunnery. You know, it, yeah. it's interesting, you know, art is, is this very strange activity. I think, all art, you know, not just writing. I think writing kind of manifests a little differently because it's such a solitary activity. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure this is something we'll talk about, you know, as we can get into this book and get into the show. You know, writing is this thing that, like, you do all by yourself. Like, yeah, uh, writing is supposed to be this holy, like, yeah, self-directed activity in a way. Like, I mean, obviously, there are, like, solo musicians, but, like, music is, like, a collaborative Act. Filmmaking yeah. is a collaborative act, even like um, 
painting to some degree is, I think, a little more collaborative just because you need to be taught so differently. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I know you want to talk a little bit about like the role writing, uh, not writing, teaching plays in this novel. I do. Yeah. Um, and I think that writing is so interesting because it's this thing that theoretically we're all taught to do. And, you know, from grade school, like everybody can, you know, write a sentence basically right. in this country, you know, as, lo as long as you are not like totally impoverished or, or, you know, to the point where you like you, you basically didn't go to school or you have like a severe like intellectual disability um, and not to talk down to people who are in those situations at all. But, you know, most people can at least write like a sentence. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so there's this kind of this idea and it's, it's something that I've, I've tried to confront in my own work. Again, it's like this thing where it's like theoretically anybody can do it um, in a way that like not everybody can like paint like, you know, Pollock or uh, Da Vinci or what, you know, whatever. Yeah. Great Clee. Ball yeah. Clee. You know, yeah. it's like even kind of basic painting requires like a very different like level of technical instruction in a way that, most people feel like they at least think that they have gotten like the technical instruction in their their kind of just basic education. Right. Yeah. There's we don't have to take painting classes. Yeah. 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 Gen ed. Um, and I think that writing is, is really weird in that way and that it becomes very frustrating when you can't do something because you feel like you should be able to do it. Yeah. Uh, in this way that, yeah, like I, I play guitar and I draw like in my free time. And it's like if I can't do something in there, like I don't feel bad in the same way where it's like if I if I'm really struggling with like describing like a landscape in a piece I'm working on or like I can't figure out the right way to like have this character talk like I feel like I should just be able to do it. Yeah, it feels like not making a shot in pool where you can see what you're supposed to do and you line the shot up and it misses and you go like, well, fuck. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, what and I'm what sure are we doing here? People yeah. who are more experienced in their art forms like feel similarly. But I think, again, just kind of uh, coming at it as, as like a, a lay person to some degree, I, I think that there is just a, a, a unique thing with writing in that regard. Yeah. And, and occasionally, like everyone in this book is a writer or in case of Crabtree, like an editor and been around writers. But occasionally Craig will be like, this person in this class just can't do it. <laughs> like a truly awful writer. She's writing some children's book that eventually does get picked up at the end, I think is the joke that somebody does publish her dumb children's book. But he was like, yeah, she, she just can't do it. She always is very critical in the workshop for whatever reason, you know? Well, I think that's interesting because I think that, um, I think that's something that the book actually does kind of point to like with Crabtree too. So, uh, if we haven't been clear enough, Crabtree is Okay. I'm going to step back for a second. Let's 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 do like a quick rundown of our characters. Yeah, correct character rundown. Yeah, I feel like we've we've been uh, really like. Kind of all over the place so far today. Um, so, OK, um, we have our main character, Brady Tripp, yeah. who is a successful novelist. He's written three books. He's currently working on his fourth, The Titular Wonder Boys, which is basically Fountain City. It's, yeah, twenty five hundred pages, uh, but it's kind of like a southern gothic like, yeah, chronicle. It, it, it's like a boomer novel, basically. It's, it's this, yeah. it's this yeah. exhaustive, like, yeah, uh, like family history novel. that's like looking at like America in this very like uh allegorical way decade by decade doomed family lines the birth yeah. of the family yeah yeah uh, it, it feels like yeah like a straight male version of bell fleur um is is kind of the vibe that that at least i got and ben also seemed to get also i was intrigued in reading it just because there are lines about how multiple chapters have no main characters and they're just descriptions of landscapes and i said uh, yes, chef, I'd have some of that, please. <laughs> like, but, but, but anyway, yeah. So then Crabtree is his friend who is his who is the his editor. And he met in college and then basically realized that he wanted to be an editor. Yeah. So Crabtree is has written and has been published. Um, but has kind of realized that he is is better suited to be an editor. I like that he's been published a story about uh, Sherlock Holmes meeting Adolf Hitler. And somebody says, this is a great trick performed by a child. Is what one of the characters <laughs> says. <laughs> so, but yeah, so yeah, he meets, um, he's like, I should be an editor because I'm just not a writer. This is friend. Yeah. Uh, and then we have um, his mistress, Sarah, who is the chancellor of 
like this universe. I, I, I don't remember what her exactly. I know she's a chancellor, but I don't remember like what her exactly role in the university is, because it seems like she's like less important than her husband. But she's a chancellor and her husband is just like chair of a department. Yeah, if the chancellor, I think, has to do like with budgetary stuff, which the book never gets into. Yeah. Where the chair can just be like, we're hiring and firing these people for this. Basically, like the way it works is a chair has to confer with usually the chancellor if they're actually going to hire somebody. But the chair picks. But so. uh, Sarah's described basically as like a, a redheaded, like uh, R. Crumb character. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she's really big, <laughs> but she loves to read. So yeah. <laughs> um. And then we have uh, uh, her husband, Gaskell, who is kind of this. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's interesting. We'll, we'll get more into sexuality stuff here in a bit, but he, he seems very fruity in a way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but he's like he's chair of this like creative writing slash English department. Uh, he has this uh, he has his own unfinished magnum opus on what the marriage of Joe DiMaggio and Marilyn Monroe like represented. Memes. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. America. And he, he has like Marilyn Monroe. He has a, a vest of hers, a jacket, a jacket. Yeah, he has like a yeah, like a, a fur line, like jacket of hers and like a bunch of Joe DiMaggio's bats. Yeah, because he's like, a, obsessed in with a, the in a shrine in his like bedroom <laughs> that becomes very important. Uh, and yeah. then we have uh, Grady's wife, uh, Emily, Emily, who is yeah. a Korean. Uh, she's a Jewish woman adopted from Korea by a Jewish American family. Yes. We don't get a lot of specifics on her, um, but she is at the start of the novel. She has just learned that Grady has been cheating on her for quite a long time with Sarah and has basically like packed up. And and left. left. Yeah, to the family house. Yes. Yeah. And then we have Grady's students. So we have James Lear, who is uh, sort of this like moody insufferable. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. hated him. Yeah. I hated every second he was on the page. <laughs> Much like in Twin Peaks, John is a big James hater. <laughs> yeah, so. Whoa. <laughs> Wait, you, you, I fuck you. <laughs> Why, you. You like James in Twin Peaks? <laughs> James has always been cool. <laughs> No, I love James. OK, I thought you were a James hater. I no, think I, I just I don't hate any characters in Twin Peaks. Every every character on Twin Peaks, uh, at least in terms of the human world, is an angel. All right. Well, well, OK, well, I stepped out of bounds. Continue. Yeah. So. James is perfect. I mean, I like Bobby more or Laura, but James, James is the hunky James Dean type that we all secretly wish we could have been. <laughs> yeah, if only that guy was more like the James in this book. It said he complains a lot and he's a little rich boy. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, we'll get a little more into James. But James is is this uh, uh, he's a compulsive liar. <laughs> um, he has a very stilted prose style. Is what we're yeah, told. His, yeah, his, his his writing is described as being dragged across shards of glass. <laughs> Um, but he is obsessed with like old Hollywood, uh, which Frank Capra is. Yeah, well. Frank yeah. Capra in particular. Um, and he writes like these kind of tortured books about like small town Pennsylvania life and like and Catholicism. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll get into J James is very important, but I loathed him. <laughs> um, and maybe it's because I could see myself in him in a way. Uh, and then we have uh, one of the more minor characters in the book, but I think still important. We have Hannah, yeah. who is uh, kind of this. She is a, a sexy, young, blonde. Was Mormon or raised Mormon? Mormon, yeah, -Mormon. Uh, writing student of Grady's, who he is obviously very attracted to. And he's very she's very clearly, I think, very attracted to him. But uh, he also is is kind of apprehending, I think, through the book that he can't keep doing this, <laughs> that he can't keep having affairs with younger women. Importantly, she lives in his house. Yes, uh, we should say. And also Grady is uh, his parents are dead. <laughs> they passed away. Uh, well, like, Grady has like a fascinating yeah, family yeah. life where his his uh, his mother like died like a couple years after he was born of a breast ulcer. Yeah. And then his father was like a one legged Korean war vet 
who killed one of the seven Jewish people who lived in their small town as a he was a cop. Yeah. And then uh, killed himself like a couple years later <laughs> because of the shame of that. Yeah. 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 Um, and so Gr- Grady is like a weird character in a lot of ways. Yeah. Like, I, again, I think that he's clearly Chabon, I think, trying to look into the future and think about like what type of person might I be in 10 years? Um, you know, he's this guy, he's been successful. He's, he has published three novels. He's landed a tenure track position. Yeah. At, like what seems to be like a fairly prestigious creative writing program. Like they have this word fest thing where like you were saying, Ben, like people, come from all over the country to this like event networking and they yeah. network. And again, like you can be like a student there and you can leave this like networking event, like with a book deal yeah, and like kind of have your future set for you. Um, but he's clearly like very tortured in a way. Like he's clearly not like worked through all these like pretty primal traumas in terms of his parents' deaths. He's also uh, in my favorite detail, a huge pothead. He's a huge pothead. <laughs> yeah. He's uh, uh, like 300 pounds, <laughs> which again, yeah. that really felt to me like Chabon being like, how can I make this person different than me? Yeah. Just, I, I yeah. found myself thinking back to, I did this like writing camp when I was in high school and I remember there was this one girl there who, she was a good writer. Don't get me wrong. But, um, I mean, as good as you can be when you're like 16, uh, and writing like genre fiction, but she, uh, uh, like, had a, a series she'd been working on for like a couple of years at that point. And the main character was a lesbian and she was at least, you know, as far as she told me she was straight. Yeah. Um, but she was like, I wanted to like make my main character different than me in like a very like concrete way so that I didn't feel like I was writing about myself. Yeah. Uh, and this felt like Chabon kind of being like, well, what am I like not? And he was like a fat, Ex Methodist. <laughs> I also just love him always like sneaking away to smoke a joint. It's a nice, just like, character. like he's like, I'm really looking forward to just rolling a fatty and listening to Ahmad Jamal, the, the jazz keyboard player. A schnauzer dick. Yeah. <laughs> the way he described yeah. the joints in this book made me want to puke. Yeah, yeah. And like, he's always referring to his weed as like my own little uh, private part stash. Of, uh, private stash of Humboldt County, California. <laughs> yeah. Like, but yeah, like his pothead, like him smoking eventually becomes like a thing that everybody thinks he's like a child as a result. And he's always like confused and befuddled. And I was telling you before we recorded, there's like a bit where he's high and paranoid and he's not dealing with his problems. So he puts a series of strange food articles into a bag and then drives away with jams. And then he goes like, what am I doing? And he has to drive all the way back after like having like the the paranoid pot fantasy like run out basically so grady is is our our protagonist and he's the character basically we first it's first person narration like yeah. we are basically reading a journal entry from him uh not like it, this isn't an epistolary novel it's not literally that but we are he's in talking his, to us yes yeah. he is talking yeah. to us we're in his head the whole time we never leave to go to anyone else's like point of view and he is interesting. You know, he again, it, it really does feel like Chabon both like trying to look at himself, but also trying to like distance himself from himself. Yeah. Um, and I think that there are ways like kind of all the characters in this book are like Chabon looking at different aspects of himself. Um, maybe not all the characters, but um you know, it really does feel like he's splitting out different parts of himself yeah. into these different roles. And he's trying to see how they bounce off each other it, as again, like, I think he's really trying to work through, like, who is Michael Chabon? Like, who is. You know, what's he trying to do? Like, why is he doing this? What does it mean to commit to writing? Like writing yeah. is a yeah. personal like it like a, like we were saying earlier, like writing is a personal pursuit. You can't be a writer and like totally like lose yourself in the way you can as as like a set musician. Yeah. I mean, there are like things you you can be like a journalist or something and you can, you know, try to distance yourself from yourself to some degree. But, you know, it's you in the page. Basically, you can't be a yeah. novelist and yeah. do that. Yeah. Uh, at least in my opinion. 
and he's trying to like sort out like who who is he and like Grady is like this this again like where he thinks he might be in 10 years yeah uh Crabtree I think is is kind of his kind of latent bisexuality that I think is this thing I never knew about him until we read uh Mysteries of Pittsburgh yeah and that's as we that talked I think about is actually like, like a him. really interesting yeah. uh like kind of wrinkle in his work because as long as I've been alive, like he's been like this married guy, like he, you know, has a very kind of typical bourgeois writer, you know, middle class lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. And like, that's not to put that down. It's just like I didn't know he was, you know, had had a bi phase at the very right. end. So I don't really know like what he identifies as today. But yeah, Grady feels like him kind of trying to work through like, what does it mean to be maybe kind of gay with it? <laughs> Yeah, um, and, and given that, like, Crabtree has been, like, uh, partying and having, you know, a lot of, like, casual sexual partners, whereas Grady's been, like, falling in and out of marriages. He's been in four yeah. marriages, yeah. like... Um, he can't seem to commit to anything. Cheating yeah. on people. Um, and, oh, I'd, know, like I think, to, I'd like to read one yeah. s- uh, small bit. Go for so it. So this is um, after Wordfest. They're going to a bar that they used to go to, and Hannah, who's been hitting on Grady... Uh, wants to dance with him. And so they're dancing and you get what you were saying, John, I think the multiple versions of Chabon in the scene. So I've been rereading arsonist. She told me to cheer me up. I supposed it's so great. She was referring to my second novel, the arsonist girl, an unpleasant little story of love and madness. I'd written during the final days down inside the doomed bunker of my second marriage to a San Francisco weather woman who I'm just call Eva B. It was a slender book whose composition had cost me a lot of misery, and I had a pretty low opinion of it myself, although it did contain a nice description of a fire at a petting zoo and a pretty good two-page sex scene in which my reader was given a taste of the heroine's rectum. (laughs) It's so tragic, uh, fucking tragic and beautiful, Grady. I love the way you write it. It's so natural. It's so plain. I was thinking it's like all your sentences seem as if they've always existed, waiting around up there in style heaven or ever for you to fetch them down. I thank you, I said. And I love what you wrote in your inscription, Grady. I'm glad. Only I'm not quite the downy innocent you think I am. I hope that isn't true, I said. And at that moment, I happened to catch a glimpse in the smoky mirrored wall of the hi-hat of an overweight, hobbled, bespectacled, aging, lank-haired, stoop-shouldered Sasquatch. His furry eye sockets dim, his gait unsteady, his arms enfolded so tightly around the bones of a helpless young angel that it was impossible to say if she was holding him up or if, on the contrary, he was dragging her down. (laughs) I stopped dancing and let go of Hannah Green, and then Janis Joplin ceased urging us to not turn our backs on love, and the last of Hannah's requests came to an end. (laughs) So... (laughs) But so such a scene of her being into him and him sort of mining his tragedy for this, you know, what he writes. Yeah. And then just being like, what, what are we doing here? Basically, like, why am I dancing with her? Yeah. So, yeah. But. Well, and I think like James is kind of this like. Maybe not wonderkind, but like this, this upwardly mobile like talent. Well, I would say he's kind of a wonderkin at the end, right? Because the, the, he gets called a wonder boy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that that comes down to like the fact that I don't like him. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the fact that, like, I think that, like, uh, if I had to read a James Lear novel, I would rather kill myself. <laughs> you mean you're not a fan of the love parade? <laughs> I would love to walk with the love parade off a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to turn a gun on the <laughs> from a rooftop and fire on them and then uh, and then kill myself with, with the same gun. I'd love to take a pot shot at James Lear uh, as the the that uh, master of ceremonies will pray and then be gunned down by Secret Service like guy tried to kill Trump like t- two months ago. Remember that? <laughs> I mean, I, I do. I do remember that. Well, it's OK. So th- we won't be reading the love parade um, is there any other characters we need to mention i think that's all of them i mean i think those are definitely like the three that are most like representative i feel like that's kind of a weakness of chabon's i think i've noticed thus far is he's not necessarily bad at writing women but he clearly does not at, le- at least at this point in his career i don't think he's comfortable with the idea of um like putting himself in like women's shoes yeah of like thinking about like what might like i guess like in a jungian sense like what would like might the 
female version of me look like. Yeah. Um, you know, all the women in this book are very. Like they feel very kind of somewhat typical roles um, in a way that like the men feel a lot more developed and a lot more um, kind of kindly treated. I don't know, like I, I don't f- like even flocks in uh, Mysteries of Pittsburgh from a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, in that kind of weird way that book did where like that's a book about like, I think like Freudian transference. It's about like the yeah. way you look at other people uh, and so, like, there is kind of a distance there, but she felt like a real person to me. Like, I felt like I'd known people like her and known them in like a like a real way. Yeah. Whereas all the women in this book feel much more archetypical. Like, I'm not saying yeah. he's necessarily treating them unkindly. Like, I don't think that like Emily is like the bitch wife. Yeah, but just because of the limitations of kind of the like con- like genre constraints, he clearly wants to work in terms of like kind of this one crazy night, one crazy weekend type of structure. The POV of Grady, yeah. The POV of Grady, like I don't think like Sarah like kind of is is again like this kind of Freudian uh, kind of like mother fit like the mommy you want to. F- fuck kind of figure she's um, huge i mean i guess he's huge too but he spends a lot too. of time like describing her like yeah. how big she is yeah um which again like i'm i was you've been holding up like your copy of the book as we've been talking and like i keep seeing like willowy twinky like 33 year old michael <laughs> chapon in the back <laughs> of your book <laughs> yeah yeah he's got his hand like and running through his hair like, if, oh, yeah i'm yeah, kind yeah, of wondering yeah. if maybe there's a uh, again kind of an r crumb complex going on there <laughs> <laughs> well and like um, sarah the, the his wife well, like is, hannah's yeah, kind yeah. of this again like idealized like she's like a better writer than or at least he thinks that she's a better writer than like most of his students yeah. um and he she's kind of this like not necessarily unattainable, but kind of this like thing where he knows like this is this would be bad if I did this. Like I can't I'm I'm in love with this person, but like I cannot like keep doing this, which I guess like good on Grady for. But he gets like weirdly close. And that's no, like, exactly. Yeah, they're and, like, yeah. it's kind of just like they're not like they're not like dancing in like a uh, like fun way. Like they're like I don't know if they're slow dancing, but like it's. It's not like dancing, like they're just like hopping up and down on a dance yeah. floor. Like they're like hutching Slow each other. Dancing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but like <sighs> the women in this book just didn't quite like they're 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 as well sketched as they can be in this kind of a book. But right. they just don't feel like they don't feel like Chabon looking at himself they look at they feel like him looking not even at like women he knows but like what he thinks women in his life like mean to him yeah and i and and based on the differences between the two a lot of the interactions between grady and sarah really speak to like whatever relationship he was in like Mm -hmm. they feel like a mature version of some of the relationships but at the same time we don't really know enough about sarah at times and it's mostly like the way grady relates to her and then to Emily, and I wanted to note in the scene where he eventually goes in to check on Emily at the Cedar, there's like this emotional hyper awareness of when he's interacting with Emily that's not there with Sarah, where he's like passively observing every like interaction that Emily does to determine if she still loves him. And then he's like, maybe I could fix things with this. And then, of course, he can't. But yeah, she just tells him to leave. <laughs> yeah. But like in, in the movie, interestingly enough, because the movie has to do certain things, just you don't even see um, Emily at all. Yeah. Uh, She's just not even in the movie. So it it just keeps things easier that way. But I think it's interesting that like he goes there and he almost saves the relationship. And then, of course, he can't. It's doomed. He's he's ruined it, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, But and and mostly the ruining is about having a kid as well. So because it turns out that Sarah is pregnant. (laughs) So, yeah. Um, I feel like we have not like talked about plot a lot in this book, which we've been alluding to it, but not really. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know. I, if you like this version, of, if you like the show where we talk less about plot and more just go in circles, uh, sound off in the comments. Um, let us let us know if you want to hear more about our Twin Peaks takes as well. <laughs> but um, so I, I, I feel like we do need to kind of get into like kind of the structure of the book a little bit. Yeah. 
So again, we kind of start off. Grady, he he kind of describes his life to us more or less. Like uh, Crabtree shows up, and that kind of this word fest event, like, is kind of this this culmination of a lot of stuff going on in like his life. Yeah. Um, and they go to word fest, and uh, kind of the, they're at ba- basically like the 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 core scene of the book. I think is kind of this this soiree like yeah. after the um after after this kind of first day of like this word fest thing where uh it's like an after party at Grady the kind of house. runs yeah. into like he runs he meets with Sarah and like Sarah tells him that she's pregnant uh, and that becomes obviously like a very fraught situation. <laughs> yeah. Um, he also alludes to Emily leaving him that morning. Basically. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think Hannah tells him that oh. Emily left. Yeah. Because Hannah lives in like their basement <laughs> and so like funny. Yeah. Saw the, Emily like packing up all her shit. And leaving. Yeah. Uh, but like he runs into James and I think kind of in this like attempt to feel paternal given the situation that he's found himself in. He kind of tries to like take James aside and be like, listen, kid, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to like let you in on like a couple things. Cause like, I think you have like something there. And crucially he sees James like put a gun to his head outside the party. Um, and we find out later that it's like um, a, it's like a it? pearl handled derringer that holds like one shot. It's like a horse pistol. Yeah, and it's supposed to be like not real. But then so yeah, James says it's yeah, a cap gun. It's a cap gun. So he as you said, he takes James under his wing. He's and sort of, like he yeah. takes him up to the chance like Sarah and the chair of the department's bedroom because the chair of the department has like again this like shrine built to Marilyn Monroe and Joe DiMaggio's marriage. He's like, I'm going to show James like the relics up here because again, James is like an old Hollywood guy. <laughs> He's a real Hollywood head. Yeah. yeah. And so like Grady somehow like Sarah's given him the combination to like get into like this closet, this, this shrine and they go in there and like uh, James like is very struck by how sad it is. Like Marilyn Monroe's like coat is like on a hanger in there instead of I don't know, doing something else. Yeah. Uh, I guess like being worn by Meryl Monroe. I don't know. He, he does a little boo hoo. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and uh, like Grady's like, OK, I'm kind of like drunk. I got to like probably sort of think about going home. And he steps outside and he trips over uh, <laughs> his mistress's blind, like incontinent dog. And the dog yeah. like starts mauling. Him. <laughs> and so yeah. James pulls his gun out and kills this dog. Yeah, he shoots the dog dead with a single <laughs> shot. <Yeah. laughs> Which is really the, the impetus for like the rest of the book. Yeah. Because yeah. all of a sudden there's like there is this secret that like Grady is like constantly trying to like it, like find a way to like explain this <laughs> and he and he's he puts the dog's corpse in the trunk and we should also note that there is a tuba in the trunk because when he picks as well up, as yeah. uh uh crabtree's like garment bag <laughs> with his drugs in it yeah drugs. <laughs> um but yeah basically the the trunk of this car which grady has received from like an acquaintance like as payment for a debt yeah i think so it's a yeah. very weird situation with this car <laughs> Which will come into play later, but um, he he puts all the shit in the car and they like almost like they're like, we're going to deal with this tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Like they go back, they go to sleep uh, or no, well, they, well, they go to they, the talk. They drop yeah. James off at like Grady's house. He goes to sleep. Grady and Crabtree go to like this bar, they, this dive bar they've been going to for years and they get like harassed by this guy like this mysterious guy who turns out to maybe be the original owner of the car because the guy couldn't have actually sold the car to Grady because he still owned the other guy still owned it. Yeah. But uh, the next day they're like, we're going to go and explain what happened to the fucking dog. (laughs) Yeah. And then like Grady like can't do it. And so they end up not doing that. And they go to like Emily's family Seder meal because it's Passover. And Irv was like, hey, we're having the Passover. And he loves Irv, who's the father of Emily. Yes. Yeah, so Irv is like kind of this this kind of patriarchal figure. And 
you know, Grady is like, oh, maybe I can still solve things as they go there. And then James like freaks out and like kills this snake that. Well, no, 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 no. Uh, Grady runs over the snake. That's right. Yeah. But James also gets so drunk. But James that he has just, a freak out. Yeah. Well, James just passes out. And then like that makes everyone really uncomfortable. So then Grady calls James's parents and they come up to the cedar to pick him up. And that's when it's implied that James has been actually lying about everything that he'd been telling. Yeah, so him James has been portraying yeah. himself as like this, like working class like wunderkind who lives at the bus station yeah, yeah. Who, he's like basically homeless like he he like comes from like this hard scrabble background and then we find out oh no he's actually like an incredibly like wealthy like uh, scion yeah, yeah. Sci- yeah. scion of yeah. this incredibly like rich family who like owns a house in like Suwiki Suwiki Grove or something which is this really like ritzy suburb of Pittsburgh yeah and Grady, like, is kind of, like, struck by the fact that he's been lied to this, like, aggressively. Uh, he doesn't really know what to make of it because these, yeah, this, like, very rich and very old couple come and, like, pick up the student that he's, like, kind of trying to take under his wing. But since he got so drunk, he passed out. He's like, I'm doing a horrible job of this. Like, your parents should be in charge, especially if you're emotionally unstable. Yeah. Also, um, we should have added that b- before this, Crabtree has basically been hitting on James. Yes, uh, and he probably yeah, Crabtree yeah. is like falling in love with James yeah. at first sight. <laughs> yeah, and he's he, and he like there's a scene where he's like giving James like a, a covert hand job at the bar that they're at, and and if Grady goes like, listen, James may not even know if he's if he's gay or not, and Grady's like, or Crabtree's like, I I think he, I think I know. <laughs> like, it's, it's what Crabtree says. like, and and that's also after Crabtree has abandoned this. Tra- trans woman that he met on a plane and they thought that her tuba should have gone in the in the back of the truck but actually it wasn't her tuba so i, mean, I don't know if they've quite abandoned her from the standpoint that a she's a drag queen yeah um i mean it is a little ambiguous because it's 1997 but like uh grady like drops this woman and or man off at like their home right after that um, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's it's not like they're like treating her like shit or anything. Well, I guess I said abandoned because like Crabtree is flirting with her and then sort of leaves her for James as soon as possible. Yeah, that's that's fair. That's fair. Um, OK. I feel like we've kind of gotten a lot of the plot out of the way. Well, let, well let's add one last okay. thing. So importantly, um, Grady has to accept that James James's upcoming novel, The Love Parade, which we've expressed interest in reading, um, is a way better of a uh, deal for Crabtree. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to read yeah. that book. I said I'd literally rather kill myself than read that book. <laughs> well, OK, so so anyway, he has to accept that for Crabtree, it's much better to sell James's book to save Crabtree's career than for them to salvage Wonder Boys because Wonder Boys was going to save both Grady and Crabtree's career. But it's it's horrible. It's an awful novel. Hannah reads it and realizes she's no longer in love with uh, Grady Tripp as a result of falling asleep during her initial read of Wonder Boys that was casually left out. And so Grady has to accept that James is getting the book deal. It's going to save Crabtree's career um, and they um, they announce that they go to get the car back. They're, Crabtree and him are riding once more into the sunset like Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. Uh, they find the car. They find the draft of the the, well, the they're, coat. They're specifically yeah. they're looking for the car because the car has the Marilyn Monroe coat, which, which James been stole and stolen yeah. by James. Yes. And Grady's trying to keep like James from getting in trouble, basically, for this situation because they killed the dog. They stole the coat. Uh they're all fucked. <laughs> yeah, so they get in a they get in a, a, a they get like, in a car chase with the <laughs> original owner of the car and his like backup and his yeah. like backup who's like like the owner was like a f- ex flyweight boxer. Yeah, um, and like his like criminal associates. It, again, it's kind of Chavon like kind of trying to do a like crime novel thing again, sort of madcap. Yeah, like a, um, adventure. And basically, the, the long story short, uh, again, Grady has the whole manuscript of Wonder Boys, which apparently he's written on a typewriter. So, 20, yeah, 2,500 pages of typewritten stuff. Yeah, with no backup. Yeah. And they, like, open the window of the car and, like, 2,000 pages of this thing just go flying out. Right, yeah, while they're, like, chasing. In a car chase. Yeah, in a car chase. And, like, 
and when he how he gets out of this scrap is he hits the the boxer with the dead snake and then throws the tuba at the other guy, which has the best line of dialogue where he goes, "You hit me with the tuba," and Grady goes, "I know, I'm sorry," and he just runs away. Like, but yeah, so then he loses Wonder Boys, he loses the book deal, uh, he thinks he's blown it with Sarah. Um, and he, he, he starts crying and then he falls down and like hits his head. Yeah. So basically like throughout the whole book, like Grady is Grady's clearly unwell. Yeah. Like I don't even just mean mentally, which I hope to the listeners is obvious at this point, <laughs> but like he's physically unwell. Yeah. Like he is kind of like the dog is like bitten him and like his ankle, like he can barely walk through a lot of the book. He's like hobbling. He's yeah. hobbling. He's, again, like, morbidly obese. He's uh, constantly smoking. Uh, he's drunk through a lot of the book. And uh, basically, like, he he has this kind of, like, denouement with... Or what he thinks is de- denouement with Sarah, where, like, Sarah basically like, tells him, like, I told my husband everything. Yeah. Uh, because they had both been, like... They're both... Like, it's kind of an interesting affair because they're both married. Like, right. they're both... Kind of, they're both cheating. There's not like one person who's necessarily more in the wrong than the other. Yeah. Uh, but Sarah's like, I told, you know, my husband and, uh, you know, she's been debating whether or not to keep this baby because clearly she's like wanted to have a baby for a while. But between her career and the fact like her husband, I think the implication is a gay man. <laughs> like, yeah, um, <laughs> you know, she hasn't had the opportunity. And uh, Grady's been trying to figure out like how he feels about that situation. Like, does he want her to get an abortion so that she he can get back together with his wife, or does he want her to get an abortion so that they can like be together but not have a child? Or does side he want note, her to see, keep the child. There's a great English teacher joke where he refers to this idea as the elephant white hills of abortion. Yes, yeah, which is a reference to. The, uh, uh, the Hemingway short, yeah, story. the Hemingway short story, which is about the getting an abortion. Yes. So yeah, but um, so Grady has been like th- trying to deal with this, and basically, like Emily tells him this, and he notices Emily is like still wearing her wedding ring when she tells him this. Yeah, and he like basically has a heart attack. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. because he's been smoking too much weed, <laughs> and he's just exhausted. And yeah, he yeah. hasn't like slept in two days. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and he like he like passes out and then we have actually like a really beautiful chapter of like Chabon basically describing Grady like astral projecting out of his body. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and kind of like experiencing like a moment of like the bliss of death, <laughs> <laughs> which also like like is sort of been hinted at with this other author character that kills himself. It's like, oh, like it could be that easy. But yeah. yeah. And, and then he comes back and, you know, I had a little trouble with the ending of this book. Chabon and endings again. At least it's Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's always this ending with Chabon's endings, at least thus far. I genuinely kind of don't remember the ending of Cavalier and Clay or Yiddish Placement Union. It's been I, I wrote this when I was in high school. Like, it's yeah. been a really long time. Um, but there is this element with at least the endings of these first two books. Where again, it feels like he wants to go really dark and he pulls the punch at the last minute. Yeah, because um, like because um, this book really feels like it feels like there is like a different version of this book where like this is all like a dying delusion. Of and he loses every trip. Yeah, yeah. And he literally just just fucking dies and is dead. <laughs> um, so he, he like comes back to in a hospital and like he's like, oh, man, what the fuck? And like his doctor's like gotta stop smoking weed man <laughs> and he's yeah. like yeah i guess so because he's a dumb fat fuck um i don't like grady much as a character either i'll be frank uh, you don't like his beautiful heart or whatever I'd, 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 like, I'd rather kill myself than read the land downstairs i'd rather kill myself than read uh whatever his other two fucking uh, books are side note i love that his first book is called uh, i haven't written here because i was i wanted to keep track of his bibliography 
Uh, it's like the Bottomlands or something. But it's great that it's a book. Oh, yeah. Bottomlands 1976. It's great that it's a book about him being a Kirouacian hobo. And it came out in 76. <laughs> like that's perfect. Chabon like meta commentary on like boomer novelists writing about their Kirouacian experiences. Like in the hindsight of the mid 70s where we're thinking about like America as a concept like 1976, the bicentennial. I mean, also, but, I think uh, uh, crucially, Chabon writing about being a bottom. Mm. Yeah, the bottom. Yeah, yeah, the bottom lands. Me being a bottom. Yeah. <laughs> See, that would have been interesting. Anyway, but but yeah. So I just he, no to the listeners. Chavon has never publicly come out as a bottom, but let's be real. <laughs> Grady saying that, like, I don't know. It's just to me that's a great meta commentary on like Grady as a boomer novelist in yeah. his heyday. But anyway, but yeah. uh, like he he comes out of like his his brief coma. Like this doctor's like, yeah, let's just stop smoking pot. And like Sarah's like, I'm going to keep the baby. I'm leaving my husband. Actually, can I come stay at your place? Yeah. Um, and I don't know. It just it felt kind of cowardly. He's rescued. He gets a happy ending. Like yeah. there's this element where there are elements of the ending where it does feel like there's a darker element. Like like you said, uh, basically, he realizes like, oh, like Crabtree is going to leave me like he does not actually like this relationship does not mean quite as much to him as it means to me uh, because I basically like let him down uh, and he is he needs to like make a living. So he's going to stay latched on James. James is going to be like his new project. Yeah, um, he's going to like make James's career. Wonder Boys is gone. Like all this shit I've spent like eight years writing is just down the fucking tubes. Uh, he the uh, chairman of the department who has been told like <laughs> he's been cheating on it with his wife. is really like, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure you lose your fucking job. And he pops him in the head with a bat. Yeah, he hits yeah, him yeah. with a bat yeah, yeah. <laughs> in front of a, a um, author named Q who uh, wonder if you have any ideas on who that might have been been supposed to be because that feels like a, a character would supposed to be some oh I, that's a good point i didn't think about it I, I i did love that q is constantly referred to as being elvin <laughs> like he's a little <laughs> tiny guy who's like he's like oh my secret self is a dramatic bitch you know like he's like <laughs> like the fact that he's like this diminutive little guy who's like constantly talking about how he's always ruining his own life for his art is like i don't know i think that's very funny and i like that grady like well, he, he keeps referring to Q as sort of like upsetting. He's like, well, he does have a point. Like he is somewhat right. That's what I do. And when he's getting popped in the head with the bat, he's like telling Q, like, are you, are you getting this? Are you writing this down? <laughs> <laughs> I also felt like that was one climax too many. Like, I like, agree. Like, I felt like there's the him losing everything and then him getting picked up. And then him getting the happy ending. And then in between all of those is him confronting Sarah's husband who hits him with the bat. Yeah, I, I think that like for me... Like when I think about like, OK, if I was writing this book, uh, yeah, I would have written just a very different book. Um, <laughs> if I was writing this book, I'm not saying I it's, wouldn't. I'm, yeah, not, I'm not saying yeah. it's a bad book. Yeah. I'm not saying it's a bad book. I'm not saying Chabon's not writing a good book. He's obviously a very good writer. <laughs> He's a better writer than me. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, but like even if great like. I think I probably would have written this this novel with like Grady just fucking dying and being dead at the end. Yeah, because um, yeah. but even if I didn't do that, I would be like he comes out of the, his like coma like three months later and like everything is like moved past him. Yeah, the world is going on like yeah. he really ha like he's he's lost his job already. Sarah's already gotten the abortion. Crabtree's moved on with James like he has nothing yeah and he has to like start over from scratch because I think that's a more honest way to end this kind of a story like I think that Chabon um I mean I'll be frank like I'm, I'm gonna be honest like I think that Chabon at least again in these first two books like he is so wedded to his idea of like wanting to write books that everyone can like yeah that it pushes him to write happy endings for characters who haven't earned them yeah yeah and uh to pull punches where like thematically they're not deserved and I think that this book is a lot more. I think it's a lot more poignant if Grady is. I don't want to say punished because I don't want it to be like a cosmic sense. Like, I don't think it's like 
God pointing his finger down and being like, you've cheated on your wife. <laughs> So you will lose your career as a creative writing professor at a mid-tier Pennsylvania <laughs> university. It is me, the god of justice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I think that, like, I think this is a novel about, like, I think it's a novel about death. Like, I think it's a novel yeah. about the death drive and, like, the Freudian sense. And I think that he pulls back at the very end. And I think this is, like, this thing that makes me, I don't know if I want to say uncomfortable with it, but... This novel to me feels like Chabon like grappling with in a in a big way, like I, I really think like his bisexual bisexuality and basically being like I have two options. I can like choose to be basically straight and to have this kind of like bourgeois middle class like writer lifestyle. Wife, kids, wife, yeah. kids, stable career. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Or I can be Crabtree. Yeah, I can be this guy who uh, parties all the time, sleeps around, uh, is unstable and thus does not have a legacy. And it's important about Crabtree is one time Grady sort of describes Crabtree's life as writing his name on water. Which is a reference from Keats. And I think it's interesting that to me, I also took that as Crabtree being like my work, like my my novel is my life. Like I'm yeah. living my life like it's this fantastic story with all these adventures, but also uh, importantly, will sort of disappear once I'm dead. Like I'm going of. to di like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to dissipate. Like I'm I am not trying to leave like this concrete legacy in the form of like children. Um. And, you know, uh, a, a like canon of work. Yeah, that is going to be like legible to the future, like I am living for myself. Um, and it feels like Chabon, like trying to puzzle out that dichotomy that I don't even know is necessarily like, actually a dichotomy. Right. Like maybe it felt like more of a dichotomy when this book was written in 1997. Yeah. And like, obviously, it was a lot harder to be like out. But like as a like bisexual person, like reading this in 2024, like there is this element where this does feel very apparent to me. Yeah. And the fact that Grady kind of gets what he wants at the end, that he survives and like he seems to take this advice he gets from like the the doctor stop smoking he yeah. stops smoking he gets serious he quote unquote like gets serious about his life like he has the kid with sarah presumably and like he's like settled into this bourgeois lifestyle and even like yeah, kind John, of losing crabtree kind of did pull doesn't on feel this one, like but i also was thinking loss. about how like let's say in he had way, gone with the full like um, author who loses in everything ending i think in that way it would feels... parallel with the august van zorn character who we haven't talked about but who's like this sort of pull poor author that initially drew crabtree and Grady together. It would also parallel with the other author who didn't make it, whose name is escaping me, but he's some guy that they sort of is legendary for basically like ruining his life as a result of being an author because of the various whims of fate and, and sort of certainty in which it comes into to being an author. So in some ways, thematically, that would make sense. Um, I do want to note that the voice at the end shifts into kind of like a second person. It's almost as if we're observing Grady sort of in this role of the aging teacher who's gotten the happy ending he deserved, which I think is an interesting choice because it's, it's more or less in first person until that end. Mm -hmm. And to me, that I think that sort of suggests that like, yeah, I know Shabon knows that he's giving this character more than a happy ending more than he deserves. But I think like he's sort of fixing him in this pose. It's yeah. like I've now chosen this life and I'm happy with it. And you can see me this way is kind of how it ends. Um, and I think that's an interesting note to end on in terms of as you were kind of alluding to choosing your path, kind of, you know, maybe you thought they were dichotomous and they weren't. But like, you know, clearly Chavon is thinking about where his life is going to end up mm -hmm. now that he's 30. Um, but I find I do buy the fact that if he had just kind of ruined Grady, it would have thematically made sense. Yeah. So it wouldn't have been out of left field. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, obviously, you always like kind of struggle to be like, well, you did this wrong. Yeah. It's like, who am, who am I to tell fucking Michael Chabon that he, <laughs> he ended his book wrong? Yeah. 
But there is just this element where it just it feels like. Like, I don't know, like, frankly, you just think about, like, what would this person actually like get in real life? And it's like, I just find it very hard to believe that they would end up like this comfy at the end. Right. Yeah, they've gotten the they've gotten the ending. Uh, and Zorn, crucially, August Van Dorn did not. Um, yes. Yeah, so, and, uh, OK, yeah. we haven't really talked about that much. And I feel like we should because yeah. Chabon is again kind of the ostensibly part of the reason we're talking about Chabon specifically is because he is someone who draws in a lot of really interesting kind of genre um, elements to his fiction. And I think, again, we're going to see that more as his his oeuvre develops here over the last next couple of books. Um, you know, I think that this book and Mysteries of Pittsburgh are uh, working in a pretty standard kind of literary style for the time. Yeah, um, I think that. Cavalier and Clay and particularly Dish Policeman's Union, which is literally a work of alternative history. We're going to see kind of these genre elements become much more dominant in his work in the same way that we've seen kind of in his short fiction and stuff we've talked about for the podcast before. And they it pokes in in this book in the ways it kind of does in Mysteries of Pittsburgh, where like an image or like a theme or something will sort of be described in terms of like Pulp Fiction. Yeah. But everything else isn't. And I just wanted to have a quick example. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, uh, I, we're going to be talking about August Van Zorn, I yes, assume. Yeah. Okay. So b- real quick, Go though, yeah. um, describing his relationship to Crabtree on the topic of Van Zorn, our friendship had at itself after 20 years come to resemble one of the towns in a Van Zorn story. A structure erected all unknowingly on a very thin membrane of reality, beneath which lay an enormous slumbering thing with one yellow eye already half open and peering right up at us. Which I think is a great way to describe like a relationship where you haven't kind of talked about some stuff that you need to talk <laughs> about. And it's described in, you know, terms of August Van Zorn, who is sort of like a Lovecraftian horror. Yeah, author. so Van Zorn is uh, actually brought up like at the very beginning of the novel. Yeah. Basically, the, the first part of the book, like the first like 10 pages, we'll just say, is describing the life of this August Van Zorn and kind of how it has impacted Grady's life, like as a person and as an author. So August Van Zorn is this guy. He lives in like kind of small town Pennsylvania, uh, like presumably a couple decades prior to Grady's birth. He uh, kind of becomes a kind of maestro of the Lovecraftian kind of cosmic horror short story. Weird tales. Weird yeah. tales, like yeah. kind of working in the medium of, or in, within the setting of kind of, again, this kind of central Pennsylvania milieu, using this kind of small town setting to, to yeah, flesh out his stories. And he is successful for that in a while, and then eventually the market for kind of weird tales dries up, uh, presumably kind of after, you know, post-war. He tries to, like, write basically like suburban comedies and shaggy dog stories. Yeah, like is chummy like, tales or something. Yeah, which yeah. I think, again, is very relevant to this book because I think that's kind of what Chabon is doing here a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, basically, uh, uh, Chabon kind of was like, instead of being content with being the maestro of this kind of like fading brand of fiction, he attempts to like change streams and, achieve commercial success again or like achieve commercial success for the first time maybe and it depresses him so much that he he kills himself well and two he he initially starts doing this to support health care for his wife right yes. who is i don't remember i think has maybe a mental health condition that's the detail i'm fuzzy on but she ends up committing suicide and then right as you were saying um, a little bit after he sort of loses the market and i think those twin sort of despairs kind of produce that yeah and so again like when i think about this book i find myself thinking a lot about like okay uh again i'm gonna do my customary thing for the podcast at this point which is where i i do like a a uh, let's be let's let's be totally honest, like a pretty kind of Pat Freudian reading. That's right, listeners. It's Freud time. So, okay. OK, 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 yeah. you know, uh, so I think like Mysteries of Pittsburgh. I mean, again, I Chamon is clearly an author who is conversant with Freud. Like there's a reason why Mysteries of Pittsburgh starts with literally art going to the library and checking out like 
a book about like letters Freud wrote. And writing his paper about it. And writing it. his yeah. paper about it. Like, yeah. the, the Chabon is not doing that not a, Like, he has clearly read this stuff. He knows, like, e- even if he's doing it subconsciously, like, th- this is, like, stuff, like, is in his background, like, in his yeah. thought process as he's working. Like, I think Mysteries of Pittsburgh is a novel. It's about, it's about transference. It's about the way you look at other people and the way that, like, you try to, like, have other people, like, fill your fantasies to, like, fill your sense of yourself. And you end up taking stuff from them for yourself as well. Exactly. Yeah. You know, that's what that book is about. I think this is a book that is about the death drive. Like, it is about this sense of ending, about the sense of, like, the ways that your life is constrained and the ways, like, that tends to manifest itself in self-destructive or like particularly like repetitive tasks yeah so you know the death drive in kind of classical freudian terms is tends to be understood to manifest a lot of times as like a pathology in repetitive action because it's basically like this idea that uh by repeating you kind of are getting yourself back to this state of uh, uh, consistent non-being yeah. that by uh, kind of this like paradoxical sense in which by like repeating things over and over again you kind of get closer and closer to the like weird immortality you have as non-conscious non-living matter yeah and I think that that is like so much of what this book is about in terms of like the way that he cannot finish Wonder Boys. He cannot commit to a relationship because all that would mean accepting death. Yeah, and I think uh, a bit about even the act of writing repetitive action, uh, an exemplary quote, um, I took a sip of coffee and gave my left cheek an exoratory smack. For the 1,000th time, I resorted to the nine-page plot outline, single-spaced, tattered, and coffee-stained, that I'd fired off on a vainglorious April morning five years before. As of this fine morning, I was halfway through its fourth page, more or less, with another five pages to go. <laughs> An accidental poisoning, a car crash, a house on fire, the births of three children and a miraculous trotter named Faithless, a theft, an arrest, a trial, an electrocution, a wedding, two funerals, a cross-country trip, two dances, a seduction in a fallout shelter, and a deer hunt. All these scenes and a dozen dozen others I had yet to write, according to the neat headings of my stupid fucking outline. <laughs> Nine central characters and a lifetime's worth of destiny that I had for the last month been attempting to compress into 50 odd pages of terse and lambent prose. I reread with scorn the confident, pompous annotations I made on that distant day. Take your time with this, and this has to be very, very big. And worst of all, this scene should read as a single vast interstate of language 3,000 miles long. How I hated the asshole who had written that note. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, that compresses all of the, like, repetitive action the like here's this thing that i'm going to do i also find this very relatable for when you write a note to yourself and then when you actually work on it you're like what was i thinking like why would i do this so but yeah the repetitive act of writing is in some sense yeah an attempt to uh, like escape the death drive yeah well and i think too so again you you brought it up earlier you know kind of this dichotomy between grady and uh crabtree crabtree where grady is Again, he's trying to create an opus. He's trying to create this thing that is... He, I mean, he's writing, like, again, in a cliche sense, the great American novel. Yeah. Like, this thing that is going to stand apart from the common run of, like, artistic production, and this is going to be, like, my proof of existence. Like, this is going to be the thing, yeah. like, it's going to become canonical. Like, I am going to, like, be able to prove that I exist in this way. Whereas uh, Crabtree, like you said, Crabtree, uh, this there's this image of him writing his name in water. Yeah. In like basically like tracing his finger through like a puddle and like writing like Crabtree. And then it just immediately goes flat. Yeah. 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 And it's kind of this thing where, like, again, I think Chabon kind of grappling with queerness in a way. It's this thing where. Like queerness is this again, kind of contrary to the thing where it's like this acceptance of the death drive in terms of like you were going to die, like you were going to not exist someday. Right. But like kind of consequentially, like you find a lot of freedom in that in that you stop becoming obsessed with this idea of like, I'm going to have children. I'm going to find like 
genetic immortality. I'm going to like leave this legacy that's going to last forever right. and keep going on and on and on and like echo through time. And like I'm part of this great chain, like queerness in a sense, uh, again, at least in terms of how it's like portrayed with Crabtree, like Crabtree is not like an assimilationist gay guy who like wants to get married and have kids. He is someone who like wants to keep like fucking and sucking and partying until he dies. And the movie actually makes this explicit allusion to uh, Dorian Gray. Yeah. And they, they more or less just like have Crabtree be kind of like a Lord Henry Wadden type figure, which the book doesn't. But I thought that parallel was important. And it's interesting because there is this element where like the acceptance, like you are not going to leave a legacy that you are not going to be the person who echoes through history. You are not going to have this level of influence like, again kind of in the way that, like crabtree is an editor he is not the person anyone is going to remember like we don't yeah. remember the guy who edited don quixote <laughs> um i mean if anyone did <laughs> that's actually a good question i uh listeners i'll have more about this later i'm gonna return and find out anyway yeah but you know it's it's this thing where it's like he's accepted kind of this this status as someone who is not going to leave like a concrete legacy by himself his whole thing is kind of handmaidening other people's legacies like into the world yeah and make it like he's he seems to have made some degree of peace with that yeah and grady has not grady not. is still trying yeah. to find a way that he can like prove his existence uh that he can like make up for the like primal sin of like kind of killing his mother and like his father like dying so early yeah um and being alone and being yeah. alone, yeah. like he wants to find this way to, you know, there, there's this really poignant scene where Irv, the like father of his his like his father in law, like he's gone to this Seder meal to like try to patch things up with his wife. And it, his father in law says, like, families are supposed to get bigger, not. But this one, like, keeps getting smaller. Yeah. And it's just kind of like, again, except the fact like the the quest of like heterosexual like bourgeois like mores is chaotic like it's yeah. this thing that can't actually be fulfilled like it's this fantasy of like this idea of, like you have kids and like you keep going because your kids keep going but no you actually do fucking die and are dead like <laughs> stories end yeah, yeah. Like, your story yeah. ends like yeah. that legacy is not really yours you know I, uh, at some point, like, again, even the people who, like, even if people are, like, still around when, like, the the big crunch happens, like, the universe literally collapses on itself, like, that's the end. Like, yeah. there is, there are, like, limits on existence in this way that um, I feel like within the context of this novel, at least, like, queerness for Chabon seems to do in this way that straightness cannot, and that necessitates, like, the happy ending. Yeah, yeah. And, um... I think also I have a bit where Hannah actually gives him feedback on the book. And it just struck me that the book is about giant family genealogies. Yeah. Of like things persisting and going on despite America changing. Uh, but when Hannah actually gives him feedback, um, uh, just say it, Hannah. Come on. It starts out great, Grady. Really great. For the first 200 pages or so, I was loving it. I mean, you heard me last night. I heard you. I said my heart squeezing itself into a tight fist of dread. But then I don't know. Don't know what. Well, then it starts. I mean, parts of it are still wonderful, amazing. But after a while, it just starts. I don't know. It gets all spread out, spread out. OK, not spread out then, but jammed too full. Like the thing with the Indian ruin. OK, first you have the Indians come, right? They build the thing. They die out. It falls apart. Hundreds of years go by. It gets buried in the 50s. Some scientist finds it and digs it out. He kills himself. All that goes on and on for like 40 pages. And I don't know. She paused and blinked her eyes and wondered for a moment at the novelty of administering criticism to her teacher. It doesn't really seem to have anything to do with your characters. I mean, it's beautiful writing, amazingly beautiful, but and all that about the town cemetery, all the headstones and their inscriptions and the bones and bodies underneath them. And that part about the different guns and the cabinet in the old house and the genealogies of their horses. And she caught herself devolving into simple litany and broke off. Grady, she said, sounding more than a little horror struck. You have whole chapters that go for 30 or 40 pages with no characters at all. <laughs> and I wrote, uh, sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> but I think like even in that example, like when it's revealed that this book is no good, it's still obsessed with genealogies and history and time. Mm -hmm. And like there's no sort of acceptance of like 
things dying and going away, basically. Yeah, like, yeah. even, like, the Indian ruins, like, the whole thing is, like, they get dug back up. <laughs> right, yeah. And they become this, yeah, like, symbol of, of the way that, like, things go on. And, and that's, I also, in that example, one of the reasons I do like this book a lot is those side jokes are so rich that I mm-hmm. like them more than almost anything else. Like, but, yeah. just that description, the description of Zorn's, like, bibliography... The, the Sisters of Darkness story that obsesses both Crabtree and Grady. Like, uh, Shaman's very good at, like, one-off gags that feel really big. Yeah, so, yeah. And, I like, I like those a lot. No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think we both agreed in kind of our pre-show discussion, like, our favorite part of the book was the description of, like, Van Zorn's life and oeuvre and kind Which of... Which isn't in the movie, crucially, but yeah. yes. Yeah. Um... And kind of the way that, like, again, Chabon is is someone who clearly like, has a lot of love for genre fiction and kind of the deeper level it's working at. Um, I guess you could say, like, kind of the subconscious level. Yeah. Where, like, cosmic horror is this thing <laughs> that is all about, like, accepting, like, the, the insignificance of humanity. It's like cosmic horror is the first, like, movement in fiction that I can think of, at least. But like accepts like the three great shocks of like Galileo, Darwin and Freud yeah. in terms of like accepting like we're not the center of the universe. If there is more out there, like it's completely uninvolved with us. And that this kind of again, like, yeah, like you're saying, like patriarchal history that we trace where it's like there is this grand like teleological progress of humanity, like charted basically through the course of like male Patrilineal right. descendants, fathers and sons, like yeah, is yeah. complete nonsense, <laughs> yeah. and that it has no, like, no, you can't find any peace in that. Actually, yeah, that any any sense of peace you find in that is delusion. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and that's like, and Shabon uses that kind of as a stand-in for like really emotionally intense moments or confusing ones. Yeah, like those are often described as we were talking in terms of like. Pulp fiction and weird tales. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, again, like there's this moment where, again, like Grady and Crabtree like meet because they both have basically plagiarized this Van Zorn story for uh, they each plagiarized one Van Zorn story for like a creative writing class in a different way. I love that Grady's is like pseudo pseudo Faulknerian. Yeah, because Grady's always getting accused of being a pseudo Faulknerian, which I think <laughs> is very funny. So but um, but they like they know like Van Zorn's oeuvre well enough to like recognize it in each other. Yeah. And so like, that's like where their initial bond comes from. Uh, and I don't think the book makes the case like Grady is secretly gay, but there is this element where it's like, they have this connection and then Grady cannot fully embrace the connection because like he necessitates like this other thing that Crabtree does not need. And there's an interesting scene where he sort of sees James after James has spent the night with Crabtree and he sort of realizes that like, Oh, they're a thing now. Yeah. Like the, and, yeah, James yeah. like accepted that like he has like a gay side at the yeah. very least. And that that has changed him in this way. Like crab, uh, Grady does not feel like he could have this level of like a revelation about himself. Yeah, and along those lines, I did have a question for you, John. Do you think Grady is a good teacher? <laughs> is it possible to tell? <laughs> so it's a little hard for me to say because, uh, like, I've never been in, like, an MFA program, for one thing, and I've certainly never been in an MFA program in the mid-90s. But um, the the times we see Grady, like, talking about his students, he's very critical, but, like, not in a way that feels particularly constructive. Yeah. Like, it doesn't seem like he's particularly interested in, like, getting his students to be better writers so much as he's... I don't even know if he's particularly interested in getting them, like, published, but if he has an interest, it's in that. Yeah, yeah. And also, uh, I don't... So I don't know for certain, but I've heard tales of, like, 90s grad school was a lot more, like... You would you would have like a seminar, you would do something for an hour, then everyone, including the professors, would go outside and smoke cigarettes in the big <laughs> circle, and then they would go back in and do the other hour. So there, I think there was a little more like meeting, hanging out with your students in the 90s that then due to probably like sexual scandals and other things, like some distance was put up a little bit so that stuff doesn't happen. So, I mean, I think yeah. part of it is just that when I think about this book, you know, something that is really interesting about this book is this way that like 
You know, I, I, I can't do the math off the top of my head, but it's like we were both very young when this book came out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like we were pre-literate when this book came out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, like, it's been a long time since then. Um, and this feels like a book that is kind of taking for granted a certain like literary landscape and particularly like a certain like trajectory that you could have as a young writer that just does not feel realistic anymore. Yeah. Uh, that makes it kind of hard to judge exactly like how realistic it is in general. Yeah. Especially Grady's. I, I would say that like Grady strikes me as a teacher who is stop trying to teach because he's maybe like just that preoccupied with like smoking weed and his own problems that like he's sort of like going through the motions. And so then when he's like mentoring James, there's a sort of like, I'm going to make sure that you're OK and kind of like a life way. But you never really see him giving any like actionable like writing advice. Yeah. It's all just like I need to make sure James doesn't off himself because I'm sort of checked out of everything else. Like, like sort of, anything but like the bare basics. Yeah. I'm like, just like, yeah, I want my students to kill themselves, obviously. <laughs> but like, I'm not really that concerned with like, are they actually good at writing? And like the, the movie kind of tries to portray him doing a little more teaching, I think, to kind of give like a fuller picture of him. But, yeah. but in the book, it's like I, I get like based on the way he sort of handles, like he rushes out of the door in the beginning and just leaves James sitting alone in the darkness. And it said like, because he'd much rather just be smoking a fat joint in his car and i'm like okay this guy's like he's on the back end of teaching for a while so well again it's just it's this very different idea of like what being in this kind of a world i think used to mean yeah where like i think that like the kind of like mfa circuit is so different now where Obviously, like, MFA's, like, being a creative writing professor has always been, like, a little different than being, like, a regular professor from the standpoint. Like, you're not researching. Like, you're expected to publish, but you're expected yeah. to publish, like, in a very different sense. Like, yeah. you're supposed yeah. to be, like, getting commercially published by, like, Doubleday or Penguin. And getting like, stories in places. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. not so much like, oh, you need to, like, get into journals, like, for your, like, groundbreaking work on like the theory of creative writing like right, yeah there was kind of this element where it was like it was almost more like an apprenticeship or yeah. like a, th there's like a craft thing you're here for and i mean i'm i'm sure that's still somewhat a thing in mfas but craft is a big word <laughs> part of it yeah. is this thing where again like the thing that's really weird with this book is that this is like a world where Again, I, I hate to sound like such like a fucking doomer, but <laughs> this is like a world where like everyone is assuming that there is like an endless market for like middle brow literary fiction. Yeah. Readers, publishers, critics, the whole package. Like no yeah. one in this book except Van Zorn, who is dead, is a genre writer. Yeah. Like no one is everyone in this book is presumed to be writing like, yeah, middle brow literary fiction about like families or, families yeah. and America yeah. and yeah bourgeois like stuff no one is like thinking about like the marketability of their work no one is like clearly like Grady I mean Grady is maybe a little bit hampered by that in the same but he's clearly like writing something that is kind of experimental See, like it's, he, that's it's why experimental I was like, yeah. because he can't like get it together it's in a bad way but it still sounds fascinating like i made that joke about man without qualities but you could say man without qualities is like many things happen without characters yeah like, so there's, there are chapters that are just digressions on topics the author's interested in no yeah, okay. yeah. and again that kind of gets back to what we were talking about a little bit before in terms of like the political economy of writing yeah but it is just this very different thing where it's like writing in this book is a career like being a doctor or a lawyer yeah and as long like maybe it's a little bit more bohemian in terms of like the the type of networking you're doing and kind of the assumptions that there are in terms of how you're supposed to comport yourself. But as long as you can like fit a certain like number of social norms and like you make the right connections, like you will have a like bourgeois middle class lifestyle if you want it. 
at worst, you'll be Crabtree and you'll be like able to create a career like on the periphery of this world where you're not a writer, but like you're an editor or a publisher yeah. or something like that. And you can still like literature is still like a, a, a sphere unto itself. Yeah. In a way that like today, like. I've thought about going for an MFA at certain points in my life and I just keep coming back to like, well, I would be paying a lot of money for basically nothing. <laughs> it would be time to work on your writing. But yeah, like the sort of the word fest would be less, um, Im- less material. Like it yeah. wouldn't be a word fest. It would just be like you working on your stuff. Well, I get, and then I could get an it. MFA and maybe yeah. that would help me get published. But guess what? Even if I got published, I'd still have to have a day job. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so there's kind of this element where it's like, I would just be learning to comport myself to a certain like commercial view of fiction uh, to maybe, yeah, have a better version of getting published, but in doing so, like, I'd be compromising basically for nothing. <laughs> yeah, that's the other interesting thing about Zorn is because he's not, uh, Van Zorn had to do it for money to support his wife. Yeah. And he was already had another job. So he almost, he would do it like, he would write really late at night, which is great. He describes hearing the rocking chair really late at night. You know, he would drink the midnight disease, you know. Um, yeah, and so it's kind of this thing again where I feel like I said this, like it's kind of this like backpedaling to like an earlier version of fiction writing where it's like it's not something you can support yourself on, but that kind of gives you more freedom in a way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and they like Van Zorn. Like they I mean, sure, they talk about other authors like I think what one of the, the, the parents of Emily's family really likes Lawrence Durrell. Yeah, who is somebody that I know about because I'm a freak, but like you don't hear about it anymore. And he was like a guy who had these grand, ambitious projects with multiple characters and historical settings and, you know, like the kind of great man fiction kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah. So, uh, and, you know, I think that. So again, uh, we're writing this in the context of like this last week, there's been a lot of um, stupid literary discourse on the Internet, as there is every week. Yeah. Uh, To quote the great Matt Chrisman, uh, we'll paraphrase, actually, this is uh, the stupidest week in the history of literature, only to be uh, trumped subsequently by every other week in (laughs) the future of literary history. Yeah, this is the architect in the Matrix going, this is the sixth time that we have run this YA lit simulation, and rest assured, we've gotten increasingly efficient at it. (laughs) (laughs) But I I saw some some conversation about kind of this idea, like, like, basically, like, the, 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 the current kind of thing where it's like authors need to be uh, like socially conscious, more or less. This idea of, like it's the role of art to like save the world, um, which I think in particularly it becomes a problem in literature because A, again, like we were saying, it's this like very self-directed thing. And B, like this is like a, a situation where we find ourselves where I don't want to, again, be too doomer and be like, Oh, literature's dead. But it's this thing where it's like, I don't know, movies are going to keep being around. Video games are going to keep being around. Whereas it's like there's this idea where it's like people who are working in literature feel a lot more doom. Yeah. And so I think that like kind of creates this weird atmosphere where it's like people become all the more desperate to like be socially relevant because like, oh, well, uh, no one reads. But maybe if I write a book about like, uh, a gay POC like young person who uh, can do magic like that will like hook enough people in that they'll read the book and like I'll be able to make like a little bit of money off of it. Yeah. And I think that like I, I remember seeing somebody um, I, I can't remember the, the name off the top of my head and I will I'll try to find it and, and put it in the show notes. But he was like, Authors need to like focus on like saving themselves before they try to save the world. Yeah, right, it's like yeah. authors can't save the world if we can't actually like get this profession to be like a feasible path for like people to make a living. Yeah, for people to even yeah get paid for writing. Yeah, yeah or for criticism or for editing. I yeah. mean, part of the reason that write like books are in such a bad place right now is that like publishing houses like are so incredibly like horrible places to work like the workload for like people in editing and publishing is so bad like people don't have like the same relationships with editors that they used to have like the idea of like 
someone having a relationship like Crabtree and Grady have yeah. in this book is like unthinkable today where it's like, oh, you have like someone who's like totally dedicated to you specifically getting this book out and they don't have 10 other people that they're trying to like get to pump out work is unthinkable today. Yeah. And the, and the like sort of like having to juggle numerous edits on various things. Yeah. yeah. And it's like this thing where I don't have the answer to any of this, but it's yeah, like people who are passionate about literature, like we need to be figuring out like how do we get people into literature unless we're accepting that like this is not a career anymore. This is a hobby. Yeah, it's a uh, vestigial amusement or something. Yeah, which yeah. I mean, I don't even know if that's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, you and I have talked about this before, yeah. but I mean, a lot of the best literature in history was written when most of the population was illiterate. <laughs> and it was written by people that weren't like, quote unquote, authors. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, uh, the, uh, we've brought it up before, you know, Don Quixote written by Cervantes. Cervantes was not a professional author for most of his life. Yeah, he, he was, was just like an ex-military guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he was like a... Yeah, he was a, a a former he was a former prisoner of the the infernal moor. <laughs> <laughs> I also like that he in in the first book of Don Quixote they meet that guy and he's saying like well, you know chival literature is good because it is a wide field which your pen can work unhindered and that's Cervantes just being like yeah I mean, I'll just write my own chivalry novel and then it just became Don Quixote. And yeah, I mean yeah. I don't know I I am kind of skeptical of this thing where we we want the arts to be professions because. I mean, I'm not saying nothing good has been produced in like the world of like commercial literature, but there is this element where it's like, I don't know, is there did we get more good work out of a time when people weren't just producing work to make a living? Yeah. Um, and it was something people were doing because they wanted to like outside of putting food on the table. Right. Yeah. And again, I don't have an answer here. I'm not pretending to. But I think that as people who were like part of this conversation, like right. we're, we're critics, <laughs> yeah. uh, we're, we're writers in, in one mode or another, like we're part of this conversation. I think that's kind of what the show is about in a way. It's like figuring out like, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Like what is, what does literature mean in this time? And I think that uh, this book made me think a lot about that because of, yeah, just think about how different the literary landscape in 1997 is compared to today. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's very well put, John. I don't know if I can add anything else other than, oh, to be a wonder boy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, maybe we should change the name of the podcast, Ben. Maybe, maybe, maybe we should be the wonder boys. The wonder boys. Yeah, we could we could we could have a side split where we just pretend to be Grady and Crabtree. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would never abandon you like that, Ben. I'd never abandon you for the gay lifestyle <laughs> like that for a twink. For a young twink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need to, I need to get into multiple affairs and then fall down some stairs <laughs> and then get me be grady. So, well, um, I guess I guess we're gonna wrap it there. So, uh, listeners, thanks for joining us on this uh, somewhat rollicking episode. Um, stay tuned; we've got a lot of great stuff coming down the pipe, um, especially for spooky season. Yeah, no, we got some. We got a fun bonus coming up here soon. We're gonna keep that on the DL in terms of what that entails, but uh, rest assured, it's going to be fun. Very uh, Van Zorn-esque. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, come back here in two weeks. We're going to be uh, talking about uh, Cyclonopedia by Reza Negrestani. Uh, Sam's going to make his triumphant uh, second appearance. He's going to receive the the Infinite Library Challenge coin, <laughs> uh, which is a very tiny book, which you have to read with the microscope. <laughs> 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 but yeah, we're, I'm really excited to have Sam on because Sam's just great for, for this kind of stuff. So I think it's going to be a great episode. Yeah, I think it's going to be fun. We're going to talk about critical theory. We're going to talk about uh, maybe some object oriented ontology. Uh, we're going to talk about oil. Yeah, we're gonna talk about oil. We're going to talk about probably how much. Uh, I'm not a fan of uh, the CCRU. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, we'll be, we'll be dunking on the CCRU. We'll see what Sam says. So. Uh, so yeah, come back here in a couple weeks, and then after that, we're going to be talking about the next Chabon book, uh, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. So big stuff coming. Uh, very excited uh, to talk about that here with you guys uh, moving here towards the end of the year. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, and Semper Books. Semper Books.
thank you for listening to the Infinite Library. If you liked our show, we we'll hope you'll subscribe and leave us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or the podcast app of your choice. It helps us a lot. If you want to follow us on social media, we can be found on Twitter, Instagram, and Blue Sky at Infinite Library Pod. If you'd like to contact our team directly with episode ideas or feedback, you can email us at infinitelibrarypod at gmail.com. Our intro music is by Amos Legend in the Forest of Mayhem. Our outro music is by DJ Daggy Diggs, and our logo is created by Lars Noir. You can support our show by supporting them. We hope you'll join us back in the stacks for the next episode soon. Semper Books, bookheads. <laughs>